Okay, so we're here to do a little bit more experimental archaeology. If you go on any kind of civil war forum or whatnot, you'll see people talking about how soldiers would take their ramrods and stick them in the dirt so they could load faster. So we're going to test that in a couple different positions, both standing and kneeling. And I've actually found a little bit of historical context for this. This wheel and attack upon the enemy's flank and rear relieved the pressure upon the 1st, 11th, and 24th regiments, which for some minutes had been engaged in almost hand-to-hand -hand contest with the enemy. Indeed, had gotten so close that the men did not take the time to return ramrods to their thimbles, but ran down cartridges and fired away, filling the logs, breastworks, and trees of ramrods. Sergeant David E. Johnston, Company D, 7th Virginia Infantry, May 5th, 1863, Battle of King's Creek. So I was able to find that direct quote um, talking about sticking ramrods against trees, not necessarily in the dirt. Uh, we also have some archaeology from the 1970s that discovered some rammers that were sticking vertically out of the ground. Clunk. Suddenly one of the metal detectors struck a hard object protruding from the ground. What was it? Reaching down, one of the men pulled free from its ancient resting place a long metal rod, now rusted from decades of exposure to the wet human climate. With astonishment, he called over to his partner that what he now held in his hand was an iron ramrod from a 19th century military issue rifle musket. What a find. Not all these relics they recovered over the next few moments were as easily located and removed at, as the first. But in a very short span of time, the two men had collected a dozen ramrods. Many of the ramrods were found, like the first one, with the rammer head partially protruding up from the ground. Others were lying flat, buried by soil and leaf deposits. All were found located along a fairly straight line parallel with the creek and from beginning to end, covered a distance of a couple hundred feet. What a find. So we have both a first-hand account and an archaeological find supporting rammers being put in the dirt or up against a tree instead of returned to their thimble in intense combat. Now, if you look at pictures of battlefields and rifle pits, you will see some rifles without rammers in them at all. I cannot find any pictures with rammers stuck in the dirt. However, a lot of these battlefields rifles were collected afterwards that would include their rammers if they were stuck in the dirt. And when they took these pictures a day or two later, they would bring rifles to lay down props. I actually found this one battle line here where you can see um, in one picture there's no rifles and they come back later and there's rifles because they placed them there to take these pictures. This was pretty common practice at the time. So we kind of have to mostly rely on soldiers' letters and accounts compared to pictures. Anyways, I have my P-53 Enfield here. I'm shooting a Burton-style cartridge, uh, not an Enfield cartridge. And I got a tree. So we're going to test standing, returning the rammer to the thimble per you know procedure. And we're also gonna try leaning up against the tree. And I think we're gonna try kind of in a skirmishing formation where we're down on a knee. We're gonna try returning our rammer to the thimble and then laying it on the ground or sticking it in the dirt. And um, so yeah, the following will kind of just be uh, ASMR, I guess. Uh, you can fast forward to it all. I'll have the results at the end. And uh, we'll see really how much faster is it? How much do I fumble with it? Because I'm very much, I drill with returning the rammer. So this is gonna be kind of a new thing, which I imagine for a lot of the soldiers at the time would not practice putting their rammer against a tree or a fence near them. So it would also be a first time thing for them. So let's get shooting. That's a good start. Okay, I lied, we'll be using the uh, Springfield 1842 because the Enfield, I'm gonna have to pull the breach out of that, I don't have time for that. Uh, smooth bore, 69 caliber, this one was made in 1847, and um, we have a longer rammer on this, like significantly longer, so this might um, change the results a little bit, but we'll see. And then uh, I'll be just shooting round ball at about 60, 70 paces, so. It's 100 grains, a .668 round ball is what I'm using.
Okay, I think I'm just gonna place it here, tulip up. And um, I'm just gonna go at it like this. That makes the most sense to me. That's a very odd motion. All right, that's all five. When you're picking it up from the tree and you're kind of down here like this, you get this weird, like one, two, three, like a shuffle, rather than when it's in your thimble, you know, one, reverse hand, out and flip. And you're right there and it's one, two, quick motions. So like, if you were undrilled entirely, probably be really slow with either one so let's switch to uh, kneeling like you were skirmishing but first we'll take a quick look at the target so I've been shooting my infield a lot so I'm used to aiming dead on I kind of forgot I have to hold high left with my 1842 there's no rear sight on it but the grouping itself isn't too incredibly bad for this range so let's try kneeling so everybody thinks of you know great lines of thousands of men for Civil War battles but Skirmishing was a thing you were trained to do and expected to do. You know, we, we kind of took that from the French doctrine that we were obsessed with for um, our training back in the 1850s. So we're going to try with the rammer in the thimble and then rammer either on the ground or in the dirt. I don't know, once I get set up, I'll kind of just see which one feels right. But this will be more difficult with this 1842 Springfield as compared to the P-53 and um, I've not practiced skirmishing with my Springfield, like ever. I've, I've only used my Enfield. So what you would do was fire your shot. You would reverse the rifle around, put the butt down here and the muzzle up here. Get your cartridge tear, pour and everything. Get your powder down there. And then you'll extract the rammer forward and bring it around and then ram. Now this rammer is so long on the 1842 I kind of have to bring it out and then grip even further up and do three motions. Whereas on my P53 Enfield, I could do the standard two motions. So we'll see how much that makes a difference. When I stick it in the ground, I'm thinking just like that and come at it like this as compared to laying it down flat like that. Especially because in my mind, my buddy comes by with some hobnail brogues and stomps on this. My rammer is going to be bent like a Cheeto. So let's try this out. I'll be starting at the ready position again.
you hear that last one? Uh, I definitely had some powder spill out loading that last cartridge. It's pretty easy to do when you're coming over with this angle. Uh, so you have to be pretty careful about that. I, that was my fault. Okay, I got my cartridges up front here now, five of them. I'm gonna have the rammer in the dirt here, so after I fire, I can bring it down, and I'm gonna come at it like this. All five, let's go check our target. There we go, that's a lot better. I'm holding top left edge on that, so. This is an enemy coming at me, I'm aiming at his right shoulder. And this is again at 70 paces. Okay, conclusion. When an enemy force does this, you're doomed, because they can shoot twice as fast. Uh, obviously that's not true, it's probably like a 5% increase, we'll see what the numbers say. But, you know, it's, it's a thing they did, obviously. Uh, it's the archeological dig that found the rods like that, and, um, the first-hand accounts of it occurring, clearly it's a thing that happened, but it's no super weapon, like people claim. Uh, we'll test another super weapon, Buck and Ball. I know Duelist has a decent video on it, but not quite in the context of the Civil War, so expect that within probably the next month. Things I notice as the individual, uh, well one, you'll notice this is an 1816 ramrod, not uh, 1842, because those break really bad reproduction ones. Like, I've broken two, so I'm freezing that. Anyway, when I'd bring it out of the mud and I'd ram my ball home, I'd have two inches of mud on the end of this rammer because it's a little bit wet out. And it would drop down into the bore, which probably didn't help with the fouling, and it was pretty slippery. I mean, I was able to grasp it, but a little annoying. Also, I was wanting to return my rammer to its thimbles because, you know, that's, that's the drill, that's how you're trained, that's how they would have done it, and that's how I ended up doing it. Uh, in my head, at least, I was thinking back to the thimble, and then I'd have to consciously be like, no, 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 put it in the mud. So, also putting it back in the thimbles afterwards, it's, it's gritty because there's dirt in there, so I'll have to clean that out. But, yeah, it was fun to test. I know it's a question literally nobody asked, but every time I see dumb forum posts, it's, I'm like, oh, I want to test that out. And anything that's an excuse to shoot in this gear because it's a lot of fun. So if you got old shit like this, I, I would highly recommend going out and getting gear and shooting it like this, especially if you have some buddies to do it with you. Um, so yeah, buck and ball video soon. Probably a video on the RDB, because uh, I know you guys love that. Sorry for doing stupid fucking Millsurp shit all the time. I'm going to do more. Uh, but we'll do some modern stuff here and there. But 
that'll honestly mainly be on tactical inquiries if you've seen the bullpup video. Um, they're kind of more better. Siri said I'm better at fucking around unless it's historical stuff. You know what? Because I hate myself and I found another 10 cartridges in my bread bag, we're gonna shoot from the lying position, which is miserable. Why did I do this? Man, that sucks. It's hard to stay in frame too. <laughs> 